So I want to take a, a very different tack on on this uh, in my comments, and I'm going to um, uh, hopefully uh, provoke some uh, reaction. <laughs> so <laughs> let's see let's see where this goes. So here are my prepared comments. So I uh, I would like to start with uh, confessing that um, I have for long been a great fan of East Asian style industrial policy. But it has been a really tricky issue to navigate or recommend in the Indian context, given our terrible experience with license right. So the received wisdom uh, within policy circles in India has for the longest time been to de-license, deregulate, liberalize, um, and give the Indian bureaucracy, most importantly, as little discretionary power as possible. At least that's been the economist mantra on policy reform. And this was the orthodox philosophy that certainly guided the 1991 reforms. And there can be little doubt that this policy mix was extremely effective. The results are there for all to see. Growth rates on average have been higher since, and export performance has been not as much as good as we'd like, but it has not been shabby. Um, and, you know, you know all the data on poverty reduction, et cetera, et cetera. So our 1991 package was undoubtedly a big success. But since then, we are now living in a very different world. Many, many things have happened and changed. So first, internationally, um, the ideas associated with the 1990s Washington consensus have become much less influential than they were. Um, and there's now a public discourse that is moving to much soul searching about the ills of neoliberal capitalism. So that's the first big change. Uh, the second change is obviously the pandemic, which has forced a much greater degree of state activism across the world. And uh, so much so that um, uh, we can now actually talk much more freely about, for example, the role that NASA has played um, in the success of Elon Musk and Mr. Bezos. Um, so the role of the state um, in industrial policy is being looked at with uh, increasing interest, even in the West, given especially that China has proved to the world um, its ability to rise up the value-added ladder with a very unique development of its own innovation ecosystem, you can call it. They have successfully pivoted using their own mix of East Asian development state policies. Um, the transformation from, or they are navigating that as we speak, investment-led growth to innovation-led growth. And that was a very important quote um, from, from the report. Uh, the third big change that has happened since 1991 um, is that within India now, there is growing evidence that the growth momentum has seen a structural break. And this has been particularly the case since 2010-11. The evidence is that the growth rate of per worker productivity has slowed down since, that whatever pickup we've seen since the pandemic is basically, you know, a base effect thing. Um, uh, the reality is that we've seen um, uh, shrinking employment share of the organized sector on a secular basis. And we've seen very tepid private investment demand um, for well over a decade now. And the final thing that has, uh, that has happened is that um, we now have a BJP government that right or wrong, is very focused on developing India's identity as a nation, refashioning India's identity as a nation, and which includes in this approach, it, a new approach to economic policy under the battle cry of self-reliance. So these are four very important changes since 1991. And it is in this context, it's in the confluence of these four factors that we need to look at this report. So I think the crux of the report was really um, uh, the case or the argument 
that a rapid progress up the value added ladder um, can come from a judicious combination of place based infrastructure development like the SEZs combined with horizontal and sectoral industrial policy, strong export orientation to a focus on trade policy, and development of soft infrastructure, which doesn't include now just the usual platitudes of, you know, legal system, ease of doing business and all that, but specifically it talks about facilitating institutions like investment promotion agencies and what you call your LCUs. So, you know, in some case study work that we've done on the development of Indian SEZs, uh, one of the biggest missing elements um, to the dynamism of SEZs we found was the facilitation that government could provide um, people who are participating in the SEZ. So making the connections um, um, uh, happen internally, um, that has been uh, uh, missing in the case of India. Um, so uh, with that message, I think that uh, uh, I wanted to provoke the discussion really for, for the wider audience with the, with, the, with the proposition that this government has actually, whether consciously or subconsciously, I don't know, but uh, laid down several markers of an incoherent policy. And it hasn't so far connected the dots. I think if they were to pay particular attention to this report, Eric, the biggest lesson that they should take away is that our efforts in India have been completely fragmented. Um, you know, as Rupa was pointing out, even sectors are operating in silos. So here, our uh, uh, PLI, the production linked incentives, for example, is I understand linked to scale uh, benchmarks. It is not connected to export performance. So there is no link between an emerging industrial policy in India and our trade policy. In fact, our trade policy has de developed recently, as Rupa again was pointing out, in a somewhat haphazard manner with effective rates of protection going haywire, uh, inverted uh, tariff rates because of, you know, ad hoc hikes and so on. No coordination between industrial and export policy. And certainly no coordination between either of those and infrastructure development. So uh, clearly, I mean, especially in a post-pandemic world, what this report articulates uh, is a real opportunity for a country like India. And we do have the state and administrative capacity, I believe, to actually pull it together. But so far, we've been lacking in strategic vision to bring all the pieces together in the coherent and effective whole that the, uh, the case for which um, uh, the report makes in a, in, a very, in a very coherent manner. Two other messages of, of the report. Um, one is uh, on, the, uh, on the greening uh, of the future and how the journey to net zero uh, will pan out. Um, and I think here, this is obviously, as the report warns, um, uh, potentially a very difficult uh, terrain for emerging market countries to, uh, to navigate, um, even including India. But there is embedded in this, given the early stage of our infrastructure development that we're at, there is still an opportunity embedded out for us in India to get it right. If we were to, again, closely strategize and coordinate the massive investment of renewable energy that needs to take place in India and locate it st strategically, overcome all the challenges we have, and we can talk about them later, that prevent universal access, the wheeling of power from solar rich states to where it is actually consumed, et cetera, et cetera. We have to solve those problems if we want to get into this game. So uh, net zero uh, adds an additional burden uh, for India, but it is still an opportunity that we can exploit. And then the final point, the final message, or the third big message of the report 
was that in this time of geopolitical conflict, um, again, a warning that um, uh, our GVC is under a, 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 an existential threat. I just wanted to speculate on that and suggest that maybe even if geopolitical tensions remain or become accentuated, as I think they likely will be, uh, in a multipolar world, could not we develop GVC-based strategies that mimic our own foreign policy, which is retain strategic autonomy? Is it not possible to strategically con- uh, create, uh, anchor uh, certain industries in particular networks and other industries in other networks? Um, so I can see some some uh, some networks that are embedded or that could theoretically be embedded um, in in a Western GVC chain, and I could see other networks be embedded in an East focused East focused um, GVC chain. Um, I'll end on one question that wasn't entirely clear uh, from my reading of the report, uh, which is. Um, Eric, you go out of your way to, to be agnostic about whether forward linkages or backward linkages are one is better than the other. But, you know, you have awakened the sleeping Amsden in me <laughs> and the sleeping Gershikron. And for a country like India, for us to pivot from investment-led, um, first we have to get to investment-led, but let's assume that we want to get from investment-led We need to get from that to innovation-led growth, right? We really need to uh, work on developing domestic value added. So there is actually a strong preference for what type of GVC um, uh, we need to participate in as uh, as India, uh, given our strategic global ambitions, and and then work backwards um, in the light of my previous uh, comments about what it would take um, to get us there.